thanks again uh, for our uh, invitation, uh, Martin, uh, for this uh, interesting uh, meeting and uh, workshop. Uh, I, I already learned a lot, and uh, it's really uh, inspiring continuing, like, you know, in this uh, interdisciplinary um, um, you know, set up uh, that uh, builds actually like new uh, hypotheses and uh, asking right question in science, which is very important and how we build like, you know, our hypotheses and to have like, you know, good models to test our hypotheses. And uh, I uh, am bringing like, you know, uh, in this lecture, a little bit uh, different uh, point of view, how to look at the immune system from the perspective of the metabolic uh, disease. Because uh, in the morning, uh, you could already uh, heard uh, from uh, my colleagues uh, uh, about uh, the immune system, like, you know, how it fights against the infectious disease. And uh, my uh, talk uh, is going to cover actually the topic on uh, obesity and uh, immunometabolism and how this uh, actually um, disease can modulate uh, adipo and uh, immune cell function and uh, how also uh, outside of adipose tissue uh, these uh, changes uh, occurring and affecting other organs that uh, kind of learn also over the decade that uh, I've been uh, working on this uh, field of uh, metabolic disease. Uh, so uh, uh, as I mentioned, like from the time when I started, uh, you know, uh, study uh, uh, during my PhD studies, uh, uh, the problem of the obesity, which we know that it's a worldwide uh, uh, problem, and uh, actually, uh, the prevalence uh, over the years uh, uh, from the map, like, you know, that you could see uh, it's suffering, like, you know, uh, people all over the world. But uh, also uh, from the statistics uh, in uh, the top uh, 10 rank uh, um, countries uh, which are suffering uh, from this uh, communicable uh, disease uh, is uh, also Czech Republic, which is maybe not uh, the top list uh, to be uh, you know, included uh, in. But uh, also what's, when I was trying to look at the prevalence of the obesity on the page of the World uh, uh, Health Organization, uh, so uh, that's the map that I found uh, recently and uh, what's already covering also other uh, problems like, you know, in uh, our modern, modernized uh, uh, population is uh, that's not only the problem of the obesity or the uh, overweight uh, situation uh, in uh, um, the the worldwide uh, population, but it's also malnutrition and uh, also the statistics says, says that uh, also in one country there is already high prevalence, not only obesity, but also undernutrition, which is also very uh, important to mention, like, you know, that uh, these uh, things are also uh, start uh, happening uh, in the early uh, stage, like, you know, in uh, childhood uh, obesity, which is, I think, uh, early stage that we already uh, heard that how obesity can epigenetically already affect our organism, our immune system, and then we are predisposed to other com uh, complications that brings uh, with uh, this disease. And what is other thing to kind of highlight is uh, that it's preventable. And this is something that we need to kind of uh, bring in our intention that we can prevent this complication because uh, it actually covers uh, very uh, uh, range, uh, different range of organs that are suffering uh, from uh, this uh, condition and uh, that uh, brings uh, other complications. But uh, where it all starts is uh, the uh, the function of uh, adipose tissue because the primary function of adipose tissue is to utilize the energy in the form of the excess calories in the form of triglycerides. But then when this uh, function of the adipose tissue is impaired, the expandability of the adipose tissue is not able like, you know, to cover all these excess calories with the obesity, that we are getting to this uh, lipid overflow situation that uh, these uh, lipids are uh, catched uh, by the other organs. They are exposed to this uh, lipotoxic uh, condition, the cardiovascular system, liver, skeletal muscle, pancreas, and uh, its uh, primary affect their function. And that leads uh, to impairment of the glucose homeostasis and insulin resistance. And uh, then from this perspective of uh, the ectopic fat accumulation uh, that uh, uh, covers actually in the other organs outside of the uh, primary adipose tissue uh, organ, uh, it's uh, the multi-organ problem that brings uh, the um, uh, effect on uh, the, like, you know, the other status of uh, uh, the whole body um, metabolism and also whole body uh, homeostasis because that's also other uh, term that I'm going to use also through my talk it's the homeostasis of tissue homeostasis and what is important in uh, terms of uh, we, uh, what kind of uh, cells are contributing to the homeostasis on the organ level and it's on the systemic level. Uh, because uh, uh, as uh, uh, it was already defined like uh, 20 years ago, 
it was uh, in the work of uh, Dr. Franze uh, in GCI uh, that uh, was the first time evidence uh, of uh, infiltration of immune cells in the adipose tissue. These are actually histological sections from uh, the obese mice that uh, actually are uh, creating uh, kind of uh, chrome like structures around uh, these hypertrophic uh, adipocytes, uh, which are uh, actually burst or, like, you know, from that stage, or, like, you know, getting uh, to the stage of the apoptosis that uh, release uh, several chemicals actually uh, infiltrate like you no know, and uh, uh, attract uh, other immune cells and this is the concept that we are like you know uh, this field uh, start like you not know, to build on the concept uh, also uh, the pro-inflammatory state uh, condition in uh, obesity and uh, as I mentioned, uh, then the uh, uh, you know uh, release of uh, these different uh, chemotractants, other uh, molecules, they are actually uh, stimulating this immune cell from the circulation to infiltrate uh, the um, adipose tissue that uh, brings uh, together like you know two conceptual like you know different cell types. Uh, in this uh, uh, concept of the tissue homeostasis, how to remove uh, of course uh, this uh, that uh, or uh, you know uh, not uh, fun functionally working. Um, adipocytes, but uh, most importantly, it's the activation of inflammatory pathways. They impair actually the metabolic function of the adipocytes, and that's insulin signaling, which is very important for the primary function of uh, this uh, tissue because uh, it's uh, regulating the glucose, trans the glucose transporters, well, which are actually handling this uh, hyperglycemic state in our body. So that's what I would like to also highlight uh, in this concept of the heterogeneity of the, each tissue that we already mentioned and how it changed. It's uh, also uh, the uh, um, knowledge uh, of uh, the uh, composition, what adipose tissue is uh, composed of. Like, you know, it's not only these major adipocytes, which are playing an uh, important role in uh, this tissue, but uh, is also stroma vascular fraction. And uh, over the years, uh, with uh, these uh, different approaches to look at uh, the changes happening in the remodeling uh, and the like, you no know, function of adipose tissue, there are studies uh, showing like, you no, know, this uh, strong vascular fraction is uh, changing uh, with uh, infiltration of different immune cell types. And uh, over these uh, 20 years, there have been already studies uh, showing that uh, it was not only macrophages, but also T, B cells. Uh, neutrophils, eosinophils, and all is this, uh, you know, um, immune cell uh, aspect uh, play important role also in the homeostasis of uh, adipose tissue. And then, uh, of course, using different uh, knockout animals to deplete the specific cell population only in the adipose tissue that brings also different aspect how the function of this tissue, which is also very important in our body, that it's not like, you know, just some like, you know, filter or buffer of uh, these uh, excess calories uh, that we can you know, kind of have the code that we can remove. It's just uh, staying with us uh, through our life and it's changing. And it's also just uh, these adaptations of the tissue that can actually modify already these immune cells as well. So uh, then we get uh, to that uh, term uh, immunometabolism, which has been uh, defined in 2011, that uh, we are getting like, you know, uh, on the same field, like, you know, uh, to interact uh, from the perspective of the immunology and the metabolism, that these uh, two disciplines are like, you know, playing important role, how we are defining uh, um, and what is our actual biological question, what we want to define, because in terms of uh, the metabolic levels, we are trying uh, to define the homeostasis like you know that how the tissue can still work uh, like you know if uh, there is like you know some impairment of uh, the primary function of uh, one cell type and then how uh, also the energy or the metabolites uh, coming from one cell type can be like you no know, handled and affecting the other cell types so uh, also other studies um uh, highlight uh, the uh, interplay between metabolic and immune system from the perspective that the immune cells and the adipocytes like you knowing this uh, term like you know, metabolic cells uh, they can share uh, common uh, properties it's also the production of the cytokines that also uh, in uh, obesity condition it has been shown that adipocytes can also produce uh, uh, with this actually uh, stressful trigger which is uh, obesity, uh, the cytokines, they can affect uh, then uh, the uh, function also the immune cells, 
but also uh, immune cells uh, can uh, engulf or like you know absorb or take up uh, the um, adipose uh, lipids. So and that's changing also their uh, phenotype because, uh, for example, uh, the adipocytes taken by uh, macrophages uh, they uh, actually uh, can be like you know present in atherosclerotic plaques and they uh, can actually change also their phenotype in terms of like you know what is going to be their primary function and how they're going to handle this energy coming from the lipids. So uh, this is the perspective how uh, we are trying also to look at uh, the point of view, like you know what it means, uh, uh, the um, uh, definition of uh, um, the immune uh, cell function and like you know that how you know these uh, cells can actually transfer like you know uh, or sharing like you know uh, these uh, these characteristics. So. Uh, um, also, uh, maybe you heard that uh, we have different type of uh, depots and uh, they are changed uh, also in uh, terms of morphology, in terms of uh, the uh, utilization of uh, different uh, um, fatty acids, but also the number of uh, um, um, mitochondria, which is also important, like you know, the reservoir energy um, for uh, utilization, actually this excess calories, and then uh, they also affect uh, their function of uh, these uh, adipocytes because they can become also beige, uh, which is also uh, one of the aspects uh, from the obesity treatment that, uh, that was like, you no know, trend uh, to induce uh, the beige or browning process in our body to have like, you no know, good, uh, you know, uh, uh, factory that you you can burn the energy and uh, besides like you no know, thinking that uh, we need to have the balance equilibrium between the intake and the you know the release of the energy because uh, that is also related to the uh, primary function of uh, these uh, adipocytes not on uh, energy storage uh, thermogenesis or a secretion of different adipokines and cytokines which are playing important role in this regulation of the full body metabolism but also how these uh, um, depots or these organs are um, reacting to this obesogenic condition, uh, which uh, many of uh, these uh, um, uh, papers uh, over these uh, 20 years already uh, nicely show with different animal models, also uh, with uh, human studies, that uh, the uh, white and brown adipose tissue can also become insulin resistant. So their primary function with the insulin signaling utilization of the glucose is not working properly and they are inflamed. So in these terms, it means they are infiltrated like, you know, with immune cells, which are actually uh, affecting their uh, primary metabolic function. And uh, uh, we were asking questions like, you know, the years like, you know, that uh, I managed uh, to work like with different uh, animal models, but also with uh, clinical samples, that how we can modulate this adipocytes immune cell function with different uh, approach in uh, obesity. Because, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it's a preventable disease. So uh, there is something like you know, that we can do. And the uh, first uh, approach, uh, which we are always trying to do, is non-pharmacological. Uh, non so to change our lifestyle, like, you know, to, uh, um, you know, uh, modulate our diet or uh, increase our exercise. Uh, if, you know, these approaches are not working properly, like, you know, for this, uh, you know, Mm, intermediate state uh, for uh, patients uh, that are at the beginning of uh, getting like, you know, uh, obesity or insulin resistance, then has to be like, you know, the approach uh, with uh, pharmac pharmacological treatment and uh, from the point of view, knowing that it's an uh, inflammatory uh, state. Uh, people are trying to use the anti-inflammatory, um, systemic anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, which are actually affecting the full body, the function of the immune system, which is not very good because, like, you know, we also mentioned that uh, it's uh, decreasing their uh, defense function of the immune cells and then, of course, uh, brings, like, you no know, other complications. So, uh, you know, there are also studies, and I'm going to uh, touch a little bit uh, on the work that we tried, like, also with uh, my colleagues, uh, also in in the uh, US and uh, also my former colleague uh, from Karolinska Institute, uh, Miriam Awadi, on the cellular specific targeting, like, you know, uh, the function of the immune cells in specific um, uh, um, uh, metabolic organ, how it actually affects the full body metabolism. And of course, the perspective from, uh, you know, clinical data, we know that uh, we can't put so all person, like, you know, based on one character in one uh, group, like, you know, and treat him, like, you know, with one uh, uh, drug, because uh, there are also other factors they are contributing to their response uh, to different phenotypes. So, of course, it's more to be done, and, yeah, and it's more uh, complex, but, and also the surgical, that's usually, like, happening when we have uh, the severe obesity, and then uh, 
uh, there is some more other problem actually with the regulation of the appetite and uh, things like that. But uh, yeah, that's not the part uh, of what I wanted to share with you today. So uh, from the point of the uh, non-pharmacological treatment, we are trying uh, to do this lifestyle intervention uh, with uh, dietary uh, restriction, like, you know, in uh, obese uh, women that uh, I uh, was uh, really lucky to have very good mentors, uh, Professor Vladimir Stig and uh, also Professor Dominique Langean from Toulouse University, that uh, we did like, you know, really interesting uh, um, a study on uh, uh, using uh, this dietary uh, intervention of obese women over half year, mm -hmm. that uh, we were able to uh, follow them uh, in uh, different time points uh, of this very low caloric uh, restriction diet to the weight maintenance stage, like, you know, they were like uh, on the low caloric diet and were able to uh, take also the uh, clinical uh, uh, adipose tissue biopsies and also follow them uh, with other measurements of clinical and uh, biochemical analysis that we were actually taking uh, this adipose tissue to look at uh, the changes happening the more, uh, over the time because uh, uh, we know that uh, some of the processes or like you no know, immune cells and uh, metabolic cells or adipocytes uh, can differently respond to this uh, kind of restriction or this kind of uh, modulation that we are trying to uh, control by, by the diet. So uh, at the time uh, we had uh, actually um, um, possibility uh, to use the microarrays uh, at the time and yeah, there was no single cell sequencing. So we were trying to look at the uh, by separation of different uh, cell types uh, to look at their transcription profile and then the whole tissue we are looking at the changes happening over these different time points and also uh, by flow cytometry to look at the composition how it changed so and also over these uh, time points that uh, we could see like no follow by improvement of uh, the um, uh, metabolic uh, parameters so uh, from this uh, transcriptomic data what we found was uh, that the macrophages and adipocytes differently respond uh, to this dietary intervention that uh, actually in this uh, first uh, stage uh, of uh, this uh, cal very low uh, calorie restriction so it was actually around uh, 800 uh, kilo calories uh, per day it was really like just liquid diet and they were also followed by the nutrition so uh, nutritionist uh, so uh, that was well uh, actually uh, handled but uh, it was very interesting uh, to us to find this result that is in this first stage of the restriction that was mostly adipocytes. They were responding like you no know, uh, with changing uh, in their like you no know, uh, transcriptomic profile. And then after this uh, weight maintenance over this uh, five or uh, six months uh, of uh, this diet, uh, we were able to see the changes of decrease of uh, the presence of these macrophages in uh, adipose tissue. <laughs> And uh, that was also uh, correlated uh, with uh, the uh, improvement of uh, glucose metabolism and uh, also insulin sensitivity parameters. And uh, yeah, that was also confirmed by uh, the flow cytometric data at the time, like, you know, we were using uh, these parameters. So this field is now moved very uh, much uh, for like also using the single cell transcriptomics uh, to really understand the heterogeneity on the level of uh, macrophages itself, like not only like, you know, these different uh, cell types, but uh, each cell type can be also, yeah, this kind of mill of uh, different uh, function of these cells. So, uh, yeah, the summary of uh, this part was uh, showing that uh, really uh, when we are looking on the cover, like, you know, on the one uh, uh, tissue, that also, yeah, this is nice uh, picture showing uh, this presence of the crone-like structure in uh, the obese uh, adipose tissue. And I remember even the discussion uh, when I brought these slides uh, to pathologists uh, to help me, like, you know, define the macrophages in adipose tissue. So he was laughing at me that uh, what I'm trying to find, like, you know, in the adipose tissue, that it's not immune organs. So why we are interested in these cell types? And, you know, at the beginning, like, you know, when you are uh, starting, like, you know, studying something uh, interesting that uh, it's now becoming, like, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, uh, knowing uh, status that uh, we are all like you no know, trying uh, to uh, look into it because uh, it's important and playing important role in this uh, crosstalk interaction between these uh, uh, different cell types but uh, that's what i wanted to mention that uh, really um, macrophages in adipose tissue took like you no know, this uh, long time uh, to really recover like you know of course that uh, we are talking from the perspective of the uh, philosophy that, uh, you know, if the uh, adipose tissue got to the same stage like that it started from the uh, beginning, we don't know yet, but definitely that the pool of also adipocytes and these immune cells uh, definitely change and they also were predisposed, like, you no, know, of course, we didn't look at the methylation or like, you no know, epigenetic changes uh, that would be also interesting to look into it from that. But um, 
as I mentioned, uh, we know that uh, these macrophages were like really interfering with the function of uh, adipocytes. So um, uh, really uh, finding the tool how we can really uh, target only one cell type in a specific tissue. That was really high a challenging question or question uh, or one million dollar that uh, well, we uh, was really lucky uh, to join the lab of uh, Professor uh, uh, Michael Czech and then also uh, with uh, the work of um, uh, Professor uh, Miriam Awadi, who is now in Karolinska Institute, that she uh, had this great idea. Uh, and I was really um, touched, like, you know, to be part of, of uh, these um, studies because it was really nice uh, to show that uh, if uh, we can target the um, um, uh, you know, macrophages only in a uh, specific uh, tissue, because as I mentioned, uh, the obesity has, uh, you know, uh, the impact on different organ system, and all of them are playing important role in the regulation of the glucose metabolism, such as liver or adipose tissue or muscle. So that's very important, like, you know, just uh, how also the obesity, like, you know, over the time, because it's also uh, in uh, many cases, uh, chronic exposure, that which organ is targeted as a first, like, you know, to hit and then actually uh, to disbalance, dysregulate uh, the whole body uh, glucose uh, homeostasis. So uh, what uh, uh, in this approach uh, we use was the preparation of this uh, glucan RNA uh, SRNA um, uh, particles, which are actually um, uh, coming from the beaker yeast. And uh, after a chemical extraction, we're able to get these uh, shells of the beta glucans. Uh, they can be actually uh, filled with uh, SRNA against your target gene. And then together with uh, the endoporter, which is amphipathic um, peptide uh, that can actually uh, bring uh, this uh, SRNA into the uh, cells, like you know, and then do the job. So uh, we're able also based on uh, this uh, the composition of these particles uh, because it's uh, uh, based from this beta glucan. It's detected uh, by uh, phagocytic cells uh, based on the actin receptor, but also based on the size. They uh, we are able, like you know, uh, to deliver them uh, to these macrophages. And, uh, you know, uh, to silence genes in uh, vivo, uh, maybe you uh, heard, like, you no, know, it's uh, not an uh, easy job. And, uh, like, you know, that always uh, things which works actually in vitro. So it's com completely uh, more complex that you are fighting uh, in the full body metabolism. So we were actually using the obese mice that we are trying to uh, uh, target these uh, adipose tissue macrophages using these particles. They were injected in these mice uh, daily and after one week we uh, look at uh, their uh, metabolic and uh, inflammatory uh, response so here you can see that uh, you know these uh, particles were labeled uh, uh, fluorescently and uh, you could see their uh, presence in the macrophages and uh, in this case we were using srna against tnf alpha or serpentine they are like you no know, inflammatory uh, genes known to be increased with obesity and uh, the uh, presence when we look at the histological section because these uh, particles were injected intraperitoneally they were present only in this epidemic or like you no know, um, relevance in um, you know clinical um, uh, morphology it's uh, visceral adipose tissue which is mostly inflamed in um, um, obesity context and not in other organs and uh, this was uh, also confirmed uh, when we look at the uh, the knockdown level in uh, uh, this TNF alpha osteopontin in this epidemic adipose tissue which was around 50 percent but not present in the liver and uh, yeah this also showed like on the uh, when we look at the uh, expression of these target genes uh, in um, uh, stuff, actually. So then we ask, okay, what's happening uh, with uh, the uh, glucose metabolism? So we me uh, measure the glucose tolerance test, uh, like, you know, uh, in these mice, and you can nicely see the improvement uh, comparing to scramble um, um, particles and also improved on the insulin signaling. And uh, that... Uh, uh, from uh, going uh, from this perspective, uh, we are interested uh, if we are able to target uh, actually the macrophages in the liver. And uh, maybe uh, with liver, you know that it's uh, the major source uh, of the macrophages. So we're uh, using actually in uh, this uh, study uh, the different approach using intravenous uh, application of these particles. And in this way, we use uh, the uh, NF kappa B, uh, uh, you know. Um, target uh, gene uh, that wanted to see like if we can uh, modulate uh, this expression that what is happening with metabolism uh, so uh, also from this picture you could nicely uh, appreciate like you know the distribution of these particles where uh, when they were 
I should radioactive labeled that uh, over seven days, like, you know, these uh, particles were accumulated in uh, liver, which was really uh, impressive. And also when we look at the uh, expression profile and, uh, you know, to uh, uh, look at the uh, presence of uh, these particles in uh, immune cells comparing to parenchymal hepatocytic uh, cells, uh, you know, the particles were present only uh, in uh, cells. And also we were able to see the significant knockdown. Just uh, very uh, encouraging, like you know, to see that uh, we can regulate uh, their function in vivo. So, and then when we look at the uh, glucose uh, tolerance test, so these uh, mice uh, had better, uh, you know, uh, improved uh, glucose tolerance uh, comparing to scramble control ones, and also the uh, regulation of uh, the gluconeogenic genes. But uh, in this way, we weren't able to see the, any impact uh, on the liver steatosis, which was also, yeah, like, you know, something uh, which uh, uh, showed, like, also the dissection from uh, the inflammation and then uh, lipid accumulation step. So, uh, just uh, talking about uh, these uh, different organs and how also this uh, inflammatory aspect uh, can play a role also in the regulation of glucose metabolism with uh, these studies and uh, using this different, uh, you know, approach, uh, similarly, specifically, like, you no know, targeting only macrophages in one tissue that we were able to see the regulation also on the systemic glucose tolerance. So, uh, from uh, that point, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the obesity affects uh, also other uh, adipose or like you know metabolic uh, organs, and uh, one of them is uh, also uh, bone and uh, skeletal system, because uh, the studies, uh, uh, clinical studies, and also animal studies show that uh, obesity uh, and diabetes uh, increase uh, the adiposity also presence in uh, bone marrow. And uh, it's correlating also with the high osteoporotic and uh, fractures, which is also very important, especially when we have, like, you know, now a uh, uh, challenge question when uh, we have an uh, aging population and, uh, you know, all these processes are happening in the also other organ system that uh, we want to uh, slow down, like, you know, uh, these processes that uh, actually brings us, like, you know, uh, to this determination of the primary function of each organ. So uh, from, uh, like, you know, knowing uh, this, uh, uh, how it works in periphery, uh, like, you know, that's why I was intrigued, like, you know, to look into this bone marrow adipose tissue, because at the time when uh, I had these sessions uh, uh, in the lab of uh, Professor uh, Mustafa Kassem, I really kind of uh, brought, like, you know, this topic, okay, we can look at this, like, you know, uh, what is happening with uh, this tissue in uh, obesity uh, condition. Because uh, uh, from the point of uh, immunology, actually bone marrow is the primary also like uh, immune organ because there are uh, present uh, different uh, cell types. So besides these uh, hematopoietic stem cells that had been already mentioned, they are playing important role also in the immune defense and uh, in the lymphoid or lymph uh, myeloid uh, precursors, which are also then released into circulation to play important role. So there are also um, uh, these uh, osteoclasts that are uh, contributing to the bone homeostasis. And uh, the other, you know, niche present in uh, this uh, uh, bone marrow that has been already mentioned uh, in morning uh, uh, presentation, these uh, stroma uh, cells, uh, this uh, bone marrow mesenchyma stem cell, they are contributing to the part of uh, the bone homeostasis, uh, bringing uh, osteoblasts, but uh, these cells can also differentiate to adipocytes. And these uh, can be, uh, these processes uh, affected by different pathophysiological condition, because uh, the um, accumulation of uh, adipose tissue in uh, bone marrow is a uh, normal, like, you no know, physiological, like, you no know, uh, process happening during aging, but also in starvation, anorexia, or uh, diabetes. And these are completely uh, different uh, conditions, like, from the physiological point of view. And uh, it has these common factors. So we just wanted to know that uh, what is happening in this function. And... Uh, so uh, in this review, we were trying uh, to summarize uh, these uh, changes because in many of the studies, you could see that uh, people are just looking only on the one parameter, and that's just hematopoietic cells or uh, then just uh, like, you know, these bone marrow cells from the perspective of the bone. Because uh, that, uh, this um, field of the bone marrow adipose started, uh, actually more of the bone biologists kind of overlook, you know, to see these uh, adipocytes present in the bone marrow. So they are kind of define it as uh, white ghosts uh, that uh, they don't play an important role in this mm -hmm. uh, microenvironment. But uh, this uh, brings us also, like you know, to this uh, tissue homeostasis and the uh, you know the balance between different immune cells and like you know these uh, stroma cells, which are important role. And in this aspect, these cells are going uh, through several steps of like you know division proliferation. So it's the energetically demanding like you no know, organ. 
And uh, in this way, like, you know, this energy is rewiring, like, you know, between uh, these cells and then how it affects, uh, you know, of course, their release into the circulation. Then, of course, this uh, primary boost, like, you know, in the bone marrow is affecting then the function of this primary organ outside of, of, of the bone. And uh, that gets, uh, like, you know, with obesity to these complications that we already mentioned uh, with uh, impairment of uh, glucose uh, tolerance. So uh, let's, uh, you know, from this aspect of uh, using different metabolic pathways, how these uh, cells are like, you know, state in uh, the quiescent or differentiated uh, stage depends on the outside triggers that it's stressful condition that can be with the injury, but uh, or infection, but it can be also uh, with uh, these uh, metabolic disturbances that are actually like, you know, uh, uh, activating these cells to uh, be prepared, like, you know, to use this energy for their differentiation or like also producing these uh, different uh, metabolites, which uh, are uh, contributing to their phenotype. And uh, on this list, as I mentioned at the beginning, so it's also now this uh, new player, like, you know, uh, in the field that uh, it's uh, this yellow or uh, bone marrow fat that uh, it's, uh, you know, first study showed that has similar characteristic of um, uh, white and brown adipocytes. But uh, in terms of uh, the um, uh, phenotype in the obesogenic condition, if uh, it can be insulin resistant or inflamed, so and how we can define this, uh, knowing uh, this definition from the peripheral adipose tissue. So we asked this question uh, uh, using uh, the animal models and uh, we use uh, high fat diet mice uh, that they were treated with uh, this um, uh, high fat uh, uh, content uh, diet uh, for up to five months. That you could see, like, you know, this nicely increase of uh, adipo. Uh, Genic, uh, like you know, compartment uh, in this uh, uh, tibia of these bones. Uh, this is also osmium staining showing uh, in these bones, like you know, in 3D culture, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 3D um, structure. Uh, the presence of these adipocytes, how they expand, like you know, these uh, tibias uh, of the uh, hypodiet mice, and has in a negative impact actually on the bones, so losing uh, trabecular cortical. And uh, also, uh, uh, losing this is like you no know, calcium staining showing uh, the decrease of the uh, dynamic uh, bone formation that uh, is uh, slowed down so that uh, contribute to their like you no know, uh, less uh, bone mass. But uh, then uh, from the perspective of adipose tissue, we look at the profile of the peripheral visceral adipose tissue, which I already showed you that it can be inflamed, insulin resistant. So these uh, were uh, in the uh, you know, same mice uh, uh, taken uh, uh, these uh, samples of visceral adipose tissue and bone marrow fat. And uh, surprising to us was uh, that these depot had a completely uh, different uh, phenotype. Almost like you know that uh, the insulin signaling genes and adipogenic genes uh, were uh, upregulated with adipositis. So it uh, goes with uh, that if this uh, depot is uh, kind of um, protected from this obesogenic or inflamed condition. And uh, uh, going uh, further, so we try also look at the um, insulin signaling, which uh, we know that's the definition uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, you know, impairment of uh, the primary function of uh, the cells. So we could see that uh, the uh, the uh, cells coming from the visceral adipose tissue were uh, uh, impaired insulin signaling. Uh, on the other hand, uh, these uh, bone marrow cells uh, had still active insulin signaling, which is also important for this, uh, you know, adipogenic uh, potential of these uh, stroma cells. So uh, this uh, also was a question for us. If, okay, uh, we don't have the presence of this inflammatory uh, environment uh, from the perspective of knowing uh, the upregulation of the inflammatory genes, that it means, okay, they have still active uh, insulin signaling, uh, would it affect them uh, from the different perspective uh, their function? So, uh, of course, it was a little bit uh, unexpected results. We wanted to be sure that if it's the same in humans. Uh, so uh, from... This um, um, hypothesis, so uh, we uh, were able to get uh, bone marrow aspirates uh, from uh, people with a uh, different uh, body mass index. So from the uh, lean, uh, overweight and obese, and we look at their differentiation potential and metabolic uh, um, uh, um, characteristics. And what we could see was uh, that uh, these cells uh, were in both ways, like, you know, uh, hyperactivated in terms of uh, increased uh, osteogenesis, adipogenesis. They had increased insulin signaling, but this was also um, 
um, associated with uh, increased uh, presence of the senescence and the ROS production. Uh, that uh, we tried then uh, through inhibition that uh, I didn't present uh, in this uh, slide, but uh, in this uh, study actually we summarized that when we control and inhibit this uh, insulin signaling in the cells, so they can uh, actually decrease their senescence phenotype and uh, also uh, production of ROS and uh, uh, changing uh, their uh, you know, potential, like, you know, to become a more uh, osteogenic genes. So uh, to us, this was also really interesting uh, hypothesis on this uh, hypermetabolic uh, stage of these cells that uh, with this obogenic condition, like, you know, they are acting this way. And, um, uh, you know, of course, the question was like, you know, when we have some treatments, uh, if we can modulate also these parameter of these bone marrow cells, bone marrow adipose tissue. So uh, in uh, this uh, study, we did already uh, here now uh, in the lab here in Prague uh, that uh, we were able to use uh, the anti-diabetic drugs, which uh, from this perspective on the aspect on the bone uh, metabolism, uh, usually these anti-diabetic drugs such as TZD, uh, TZDs or thiazolidin dions, they are activators of PPAR gamma because that's the major uh, problem of the peripheral adipocytes that they have not active this uh, pathway. But if that is promoted, uh, so it's promoting also PPAR gamma in bone that actually increase the adiposity and then uh, actually uh, cause the side effects uh, of the increased fractures. So uh, there were already uh, now um, uh, colleagues, uh, you know, they are working actually on different TZDs analogs. They have less actually activity on the activation of uh, PPAR gamma. And uh, we use it in this study uh, to uh, see if uh, these uh, different uh, TZD drugs, like, you know, can have different uh, effect uh, on the bone uh, environment. So uh, from uh, um, the micro uh, structural, um, you know, analysis uh, of the bone structure uh, of uh, actually vertebra, because that's also the um, site of the risk of the fractures uh, in animals and also humans, we could see that uh, the um, uh, uh, porosity, which is also one of the parameters of uh, the uh, losing, like, you know, good uh, bone quality, was uh, decreased, so it's also nicely shown by these pictures that uh, these pores were uh, actually decreased uh, in these uh, cortical bones uh, of uh, the uh, drug, like you know, uh, that has less uh, side effects. We could see also the improvement of the bone strength. Sorry, and um, uh, we could see also the changes on the uh, level of the bone marrow adipocytes. So this is also a really nice work because um, it's hard to see inside of the bones. So we need to have like a good imaging methods how uh, we can evaluate because this is also kind of, uh, you know, a future direction that also now uh, like uh, also in our team, but also like other uh, biologists uh, like know that uh, working uh, on this topic are trying to find better methods, better um, parameters uh, to evaluate uh, this uh, this characteristic happening inside the bones, and uh, we are able with the contrast agent uh, to see by the micro CT the different composition of this adipocyte. And uh, it also uh, changed the differential potential. I don't know how I'm with time. Uh, eight, eight minutes. Okay, so yeah, I don't know if I'm rushing too much, but just uh, uh, wanted to give you like the flavor of uh, these different type of adipocytes and how they behave like you know in these uh, conditions uh, with the system go local regulation. But also with these uh, different um, anti-diabetic drugs, that uh, pioglitazin, which is typical P uh, TZD, uh, we could see that uh, it has really like no tremendous uh, effect on the differentiation that uh, didn't stimulate the adipogenesis, but it's promoting uh, the osteogenesis. But uh, also very interesting data, which we got was about the utilization of different nutrients and the inflammatory um, aspect of, of the cells uh, you know, in this treatment, because um uh, this was uh, also um, you know uh, to us like you know uh, how this uh, drug differently works comparing to a peripheral adipose tissue because for example these uh, TZDs are actually um uh, stimulating this uh, PPAR gamma uh, uh, stimulation and then utilization of glucose but in these cells we uh, could see that uh, the glucose wasn't the primary that they are mostly like utilizing uh, glutamine and that uh, was also shown that the glutamine is important for osteoblast uh, osteoblastogenesis and that was also the parameter that we found 
And uh, also this uh, parameter on the uh, inflammatory aspect was that uh, uh, these uh, TZDs are in periphery actually uh, decreasing inflammation. However, in these uh, bone cells, we could see the upregulation of the inflammatory uh, markers and uh, also uh, senescence markers, which were decreased uh, with uh, the other TZD analog. So that's uh, just uh, the summary of all these aspects that we could, uh, you know, uh, use in uh, just a different approach, how uh, we can look at also uh, on the different organ level, like, you know, uh, these uh, changes happening uh, when we are trying to regulate uh, things uh, in uh, uh, also uh, different organs. Because uh, here I wanted to kind of highlight uh, the uh, from the talk, what I was talking about, this peripheral adipose tissue, and how we can define in the local environment the inflammation or like, you know, just how these uh, immune cells uh, can play a role, like, you know, in this uh, tissue homeostasis, because if um, peripheral adipose tissue, you know, basically uh, we have this uh, uh, hypertrophic um, uh, adipocytes and then the infiltration of immune cells. So it's like, you know, less immune cells, they are coming and uh, doing like, you know, the worse, like, you know, to that tissue. On the other hand, we have uh, this uh, bone marrow fat that has a uh, primary, uh, like, no reservoir of the immune cells or the progenitors of immune cells. And then we have these invading adipocytes. They are, uh, like, you know, taking over over the time. That uh, these, uh, of course, uh, where when we are uh, looking uh, at these changes, of course, like, you know, it's uh, early stage or in predisposition, like, you know, when they are exposed to obesogenic factor or it's with aging or uh, then uh, uh, with uh, this uh, chronic exposure, you know, this, uh, of course, can become completely changed. And uh, from that perspective, that how it is, uh, you know, uh, translated on the systemic level, that, uh, of course, uh, not functioning uh, peripheral adipose tissue uh, causing, uh, you know, impairment of the glucose metabolism, ectopic fat accumulation, hyperlipidemia, and insulin resistance. Uh, on the other hand, this uh, presence of active, uh, you know, uh, metabolic uh, pathway in the bones can lead actually to this uh, um, accelerating senescence and exhaustion of the cells. That uh, I also uh, wanted to mention, like, you know, this uh, term that I would like to discuss with Thomas, yeah, like, you know, how to define exhaustion. So for us, it was like, you know, this hypermetabolic uh, status of the cells that they lead, like, you know, to their senescence and you know, uh, losing uh, their uh, uh, multipotency potential. And uh, from uh, this uh, uh, point of view, like, you know, how to look at, uh, you know, these uh, problems in the full body uh, system is uh, that uh, I really like uh, these uh, papers uh, showing on uh, the organ levels uh, that each uh, organ actually age a different rate because, of course, their function is changed. And, uh, of course, uh, how we want to actually target that and uh, on the specific of, like, you know, the timing of the treatment and uh, how we can predispose, like, you know, this uh, complications, because uh, this is, I think, uh, something uh, we have to take into consideration uh, that uh, when we are looking like, you know, just from the perspective only from one cell type or one uh, organ system, but it's also working uh, in uh, the global uh, crosstalk between different organs, especially when these cells are, you know, um, um, have, uh, you know, uh, they uh, care, like, you know, of course, uh, these uh, different or carry uh, these uh, different pathways, they are present in all of them. So, of course, when we are approaching with the systemic treatment, so uh, we can actually, uh, um, you know, improve the function in one organ, but in the other one, we are actually causing a worse uh, phenotype. So that's how we need to look into it. So thank you for your attention. And also I would like to thank all uh, my colleagues and also my former colleagues that really inspire me on this uh, work, uh, continuing like, you know, uh, to ask new questions and kind of uh, breaking the dogma uh, in terms of like, you know, just how this, uh, you know, um, um, physiological uh, condition can affect like, you know, the cross tall between organs. And also I really like the citation of the Marie Curie because that's how we have to kind of look into it. That's no fear, like, you know, uh, you know that uh, it's important for uh, our life, like, you know, to ask a good question and when we understand them. Um, okay, thank you very much for the, the very rich talk with uh, a lot of data and, and fascinating information about uh, animal species and the immune system and how they interact. I was wondering, like, because there are some animals that naturally accumulate a lot of animal species, right? Uh, I think things here about animals like bears, seals, maybe elephants, right? So I was wondering how, how does it work in their case? Do they also have like this kind of phenotype of their animal species? 
Because if not, maybe there is something hold the key to understand like what's really uh, different about us humans. And then maybe if there is an elevation, maybe there is some sort of adaptive advantage from that. Maybe if bears who elevate their very dramatic kind of height, then uh, are more likely to find infection, for example, when they sleep uh, in winter time. For example, I don't know. Just uh, here to the side. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's a great question. And uh, actually, I was kind of expecting that maybe that could bring like, you know, to our hypothesis because uh, these animals um, are in different conditions. For example, bears are uh, hibernating. So that's the phase in which they are accumulating fat for the energy storage to survive uh, that winter time. So it's completely different exposure because then uh, we are talking about the cold exposure in a uh, uh, human. And that's also uh, one of the approach uh, how uh, people are trying uh, to treat obesity, like you know, this inducing homogenic, uh, you know, potential of uh, adipocytes. For example, for seal, it's also different uh, environment because they are also kind of in the cold environment, and uh, they are also, I don't think, like you know, they are moving a lot, so they need, like you know, some how, like you know, to protect their body temperature. So de definitely, uh, from uh, the uh, evolutionary perspective, that would be really interesting how uh, these uh, phenotypes are uh, changing, like in uh, context of this condition, and what are different, uh, you know, pathways or molecules secreted uh, by uh, by these uh, depots. But of course, it's not easy um, uh, to get this kind of uh, biopsies yeah, from these animals. Uh, actually, when uh, I work in uh, Denmark, so uh, they were actually trying um, uh, to uh, get the biopsy from the bear from the hibernating bear. Mm -hmm. So that was even actually uh, the talk about how they were actually, uh, you know, trying to find these bears and take the biopsy because that was also kind of a approach that they wanted to see, like, you know, this protective phenotype that uh, we would like to, you know, of course, promote in uh, human adipose tissue. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I really enjoyed it. It's uh, both to my heart, the adipose tissue. Uh, I will sit down to a few uh, techniques or uh, maybe rare observations. Uh, maybe it's trivial, but uh, could you explain uh, why why the particles were accumulated in the liver on the seventh day? Why were they accumulated earlier or later? What's the reason behind it? So uh, with intravenous, so it's going into circulation. So uh, there are like, you know, the primary organs, they are like, you know, taking up, like, you know, that's the lung. But then, of course, over the time, like, you know, uh, this uh, reservoir of like, you know, also through the circulation, they could actually get like, you know, this monocell. But then it's about this infiltration of this immune cell that they get into uh, uh, liver. That uh, of course I don't know exactly the dynamic of exchange of these immune uh, of the monocytes in the liver. Uh, that uh, it's just the major reservoir, so that uh, also ended up like you know in the, uh, these livers. So also that took us longer to see this metabolic effect, comparing uh, to uh, you know uh, directly uh, you know inject uh, these particles in uh, this uh, you know environment of the peripheral fat, like you know in uh, uh, abdomen, because uh, the uh, peripheral fat was the most inflamed tissue. So that's why it was taken right away. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, uh, can I also ask uh, whether you observed uh, increase in uh, fibrotic, uh, fibrotic extracellular matter in the bone marrow uh, under the conditions of obesity or whether it's without fibrotic? I think from this perspective, uh, it's mostly for the regeneration when uh, you have like, you know, the injured or like, you know, the break bones and then you need to uh, regenerate. So from this uh, perspective, I don't think uh, there is definition of the fibrosis uh, like we know it from the peripheral tissue. There is like, you know, the other aspects uh, like, you know, that I said, like, you know, that's uh, uh, the organ that it's filled with the immune progenitor. So it's completely like, you know, the different environment and these adipocytes are coming later on. So it's most like, you know, just the signal or the secretum that it's uh, actually sensed like you know in the circulation so i don't know about uh, the presence of fibrosis there okay so then there's uh, no no like relation of colonies or you haven't observed it or the collagen is actually important uh, for the bone aspect because uh, it's uh, important, uh, especially with regeneration, uh, that the cells has to be first like you no know, uh, chondrocytes, then they are like you no know, changed like you no know, to bone size, but not inside uh, of course, there is extracellular matrix, of course, 
that's uh, that's uh, this part, uh, but it's mostly like you know to supporting this stroma that is there. But uh, this like you know it's a uh, different perspective of uh, the proposition of uh, which cell of types like you know that how they get the signal like you know what is their primary function to do it. All right. So yeah. Uh, I would like to look on your very interesting and very well covered topic from evolutionary perspective, asking for a homo sapiens. Sorry. Uh, so we were not born with clones. We are used evolutionary not to live in a normal term, but a regularly uh, uh, somehow live in a quite strong hypothermy, including the warm or environments we eat at little bit of So now the my question is what is more or less normal uh adipose tissue morphology and physiology for those who does not experience the Western civilization which is biasing more or less the energy inputs and also obviously uh, the the fit of the adipose tissue to the to the to the environmental clues. And you mentioned the, the dash adipose tissue, which seems to be much more normal and much more abundant in a normal situation compared to the civilized us civilized people who try to not to, to be cold. So I'm trying to understand what is kind of a uh, Normality, and you mentioned that uh, many aspects of the pathologies are preventable. So, is the prevention kind of a return to the original state of of uh, hypothermic experience? Oftentimes, teasing the adipose tissue to switch to the to the beige with anti-inflammatory responses. And the last kind of remark. There was a little price about the uh, uh, ancient genomes, and what I feel is kind of a take-home message that there was a quite rapid evolution in some some gene traits, but not too much about the energetic metabolism. So we, my feeling is that we live more or less with the same genes as fifty thousand years ago, only living completely different lifestyle, maybe spoiling quite substantially our our Yeah, thank you for the, for this comment. So um, I take it uh, from the perspective of like you know the evolutionary uh, you know exposure of uh, this uh, like you know there was also mentioned uh, by uh, Mihai about this uh, famina you know exposure like you not know, to civilization. It's also uh, in uh, you know from perspective uh, that uh, we are uh, going like you know with uh, these um, uh, you know cycles of uh, energy excess and then like you know starvation, and these are already like you know really huge uh, you know um, changes in our metabolism on different uh, cellular level like you know to adapt and that was also mentioned with these epigenetic changes. I don't think like you know in that uh, case like you know they look at that that uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, in this, uh, like, you no know, uh, really old uh, age, like, you no know, ago, that uh, they actually suffer for a long time, maybe with starvation until they got fed. And this really changed their phenotype of adaptation. And uh, uh, in our civilized, uh, you know, um, country, like, you no, know, just getting, like, you know, the access uh, to energy constantly, that we don't have time to uh, actually uh, um, use all that energy that we are getting. So we are getting on this uh, shifting, like, you know, this energy balance that, uh, you know, the uh, our body or our different organs are trying to use this energy in different way like you know to store it like you know for uh you know later on like you no know, starvation time which is never happening so then with this uh, cycle like you know we are just accumulating like you know this uh, uh you know bad uh you know uh excess calories uh that are actually uh, doing harm like you know to organs we are not you know supposed to be exposed for such a long time so I think this is about this uh, balance uh, that, uh, you know, uh, normally, like, you know, in this uh, wild nature, like, you know, uh, we know, like, you know, that uh, our body has to be adapted, like, you know, to protect. But then when uh, we are, like, protected, like, you know, in this way of these excess calories constantly, it's even just uh, using uh, air conditioning. 
you know, we are just not adapting, like, you know, the temperature which is outside, because if we will be, feel like, you no know, really hot, we will not have, like, you know, the appetite, uh, like, you know, to have a burger, just instead, like, you know, get a liter of water. So that is also something like, you know, just changing conceptually, like, you know, just our behavior, like, you know, also, like, you know, the triggers uh, that uh, I think that is uh, also happening uh, in this case, like, you know, of uh, the exposure, like, you know, for the chronic, uh, uh, you know, longer time. And the beige, like it's you know, normal or it's kind of a special thing. Yeah, I don't know if it was present, like you know, this uh, hundred years ago, because this is also something that our maybe body is just adapting, like you know, to these excess calories that we are presenting there, and okay, uh, trying to find this way how we can burn these calories, you know, the other way because uh, you know our nervous system is not uh, you know getting uh, this uh, signal like you know stop the appetite and getting like you know this uh, more food because uh, then uh, it's just like you know uh, you know storing in in our organs. All right, uh, so we have Mihai, then then Dominic, and then I'm gonna uh, pay attention to some Zoom questions. So speaking, keeping with that uh, evolutionary aspects, because uh, I, I also wonder myself always. We are tending to to put everything on the level of well, energy. We need energy for that and for that, and uh, we are not adapted and so on. But I was always thinking, and in evolutionary. Um, Aspects uh, uh, theory is also very well known sexual uh, selection, and I'm wondering myself how much is also sexual selection playing a role in evolutionary aspects regarding overweight and even obesity. If we look at at Neolithic societies in which the uh, in which the cult of fecundity was incredibly important, we know well Venus the Venus statues from. Austria, for example, in which obesity, we think now that we look at obesity well, it's not nice, but in other times it was very different. And actually a slightly overweight meant, meant also higher fecundity, basically, for the women at that time. So that was also a sexual selection component. And now the sexual component acts differently because obesity also has deleterious effects on, through obesity has deleterious effects on fecundity, polycystic ovarian syndrome and so on, on the one hand, and also the aesthetic aspects have strongly changed compared with the initial Neolithic societies. What do you think that a humans will look like in 10,000 years? <laughs> I, I don't know nothing about it. I don't know if it's just going to be the hologram somewhere, like, and we are in space or... <laughs> no, but uh, assuming that we're still living on Earth with... Uh, okay. Oh, of course, yeah, like, you know, that uh, this uh, Venus uh, model that has, like, you know, actually some uh, even explanation behind it, because, uh, yeah, like, now uh, we know that even uh, glutal fat has, like, protective effect, and uh, these women with this uh, pear shape, like, you know, uh, uh, phenotype have uh, better, for example, cardiovascular, uh, you know, and... Uh, yeah, but what, what I mean is, I, I think the cultural aspects and, and and sexual preference actually are very important drivers of, of evolution as well. That's why the, the poem has beautiful feathers and uh, you know, I mean, I'm not here. Yeah, I never. This is a serious scientific discussion, but I think that nobody considers that when discussing obesity. Yeah, but and, and I think it's not right actually because it has a very important component. I think. No, no, of course, yeah, but uh, definitely it's known that obesity actually, uh, you know, uh, transfer like, you know, this complication to the progeny. So yeah. I don't think like, you know, that would be like, you know, the way to go. So definitely, I think uh, I believe in balance. So <laughs> just so that uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be like completely lean or like, you know, just fit. You know, because that uh, we can have like, you know, even like, you know, a little bit uh, higher weight. But then if you have enough uh, lean mass, like muscle mass, that's important, like, you know, to utilize all this energy. All right, Dominic, please. Uh, um, very uh, interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. I have a question. So if I'm continuing on this evolutional point of view, in the past, people didn't eat sugar. This our invention in the last. 100 or 150 years. Even now, some uh, sports fan, in order to really last for longer, like uh, these endurance sports, 
they go from the fat diet, having not one a molecule of sugar for two or three years, because only then you can switch the metabolism from sugar to fat metabolism. So if you talk about the evolution, is it isn't it that we were actually selected more for fat metabolism than sugar? And this is the invention of the last hundred years, and this is why we don't know what to do with that. Oh, our body does not know. We don't sleep, we don't move, we don't sit on the computers and eat sugar. In Canada, when they made the called Inuits, the, uh, the, the reserves somewhere there in the north, they put them in the limited area and then give them sugar. 50% of them got diabetes right away. So their metabolism was absolutely not adjusted to sugar. They live on a completely different diet. So I think that if you consider these dietary selection pressures, we live in a very different world than 100 years ago. So maybe this is also the why we have this problem. Another question I would have, do you think that adipocytes are is immune issue or not? Because that really go along with our definition of immune system. So can they function as a sentinels of our metabolism? So if you overweight, they're getting bigger, but they signal, oh, be careful, now we are really getting fat. And the immune system reacts to this. And the third question is, you mentioned uh, uh, the immuno and the metabolism axis, uh, for, sure, for sure, and, and you completely uh, didn't mention the neuro axis, so the brain. But I think that the brain has a huge role in this. So can we in a few sentences just uh, determine whether the brain is overseated over the immune system, or what are the relationship in this Bermuda Triangle? If I, if I can say so. Thank you. Thank you for challenging questions. Yeah, that's uh, like, you know, the, our feel like also in uh, metabolic disease are working on. And that's also yeah, from the perspective on which organ, like, you know, you're looking to that uh, I feel like, okay, that's the major regulator of, of these processes. Maybe I'm just going from the last question. Uh, yeah, the uh, neuro axis is very important and it's very complex, especially also in uh, regulation of the bones because you have uh, differences on the local, you know, uh, uh, you know, environment, and then like, you know, the systemic regulation of uh, these uh, processes happening in each tissue. And uh, it's now known also this neuro axis uh, to the macrophages. So there is also like, you know, the, this uh, um, uh, nice talk, uh, uh, like I remember now, like, you know, the um, research, but they are like uh, looking at this uh, like connection around like, you know, the macrophages are like, you know, around uh, this uh, neuroaxon. So like, you know, they are uh, actually sensing like, you know, these uh, signals and they are transferring in their phenotype also that how it aspects also in the terms of uh, adipose tissue. So uh, then uh, it's uh, definitely, uh, I, can tell you, like, you know, from the perspective, which organ is taking over. So definitely, like, you know, this nervous uh, system, it's important. And uh, definitely also these metabolic uh, cells, like, you know, adipocytes are, you know, uh, releasing, like, you know, these um, uh, cytokines, chemokines. So depends, like, how we are actually... Um, defining uh, the immune function of uh, of the cell so if it's just this secretory function to connect like you know interact with the immune system so yes but then if it's like you know just building some antibodies or like you know then uh, of course uh, to engulf like you know this uh, other like you know, detrimental aspects so i don't think they have this possibility but it's just also about that uh, now we know about uh, this uh, cross cell between cells just uh, sending some uh, through the vesicles like you no know, microparticles like you know just uh, to affect uh, the function of the other cells to do their job because they are primarily like you no know, made to do that so i think yeah that uh, could be interesting and uh exposure like you know to this uh, uh sugar i yeah completely uh agree like you know that uh, we are like you know uh, trying like you know to adapt uh, our system like you know to deal with this like you know this uh, higher like of course uh, glucose is a good source because it's uh, highly uh, like you numbers know, and used uh, of course uh, from the fat and uh, from uh, protein it takes longer energy like you know just to get them like to this uh, li a little like you no know, nutrition blocks like you know to use it uh, utilize uh, in our organs so uh, it's like you know this uh, fast response but of 
of course, like, you know, if we have it exposed, like, you know, uh, over, like, you know, uh, these uh, other nutrients that are important uh, for the homeostasis, because like, you know, these nutrients coming from proteins, for example, glutamine, which is a very important antioxidant aspect. So this is also something that we need to take uh, into account, like, you know, just, okay, uh, that uh, this has to be, uh, you know, uh, more controlled and we have to realize it also. I have to also I, I, myself, like, you know, just kind of controlling myself, like, you know, many times when you are focused, like, you know, working, like, you know, when you're sitting all day, like in front of computer, I was like, yeah, I never like, you know, did any steps today, luckily through the smartwatch, like, you know, that you can a little bit be aware of, like, you know, what's happening with your body. But yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay, so let's uh, move with the questions over Zoom. So there are some uh, in the chat. Uh, I'm going to read them. Bone fractures are more likely to occur in those who have undergone uh, bariatric surgery. What might be the mechanism? Hmm. So, yeah, thank you very much. That's a good point uh, because, uh, yeah, in this case, uh, it's uh, bariatric surgery that it's taking uh, some of these uh, gastrointestinal, like, you know, intestine parts that absorbs actually calcium and, like, all uh, important minerals. So uh, that uh, uh, actually uh, that regulates uh, the bone homeostasis. So then uh, the bones are, like, you know, not getting, like, you know, important aspects to build, like, you know, the healthy bones. So that's why, like, you know, uh, this is the regulation there. And then also the activation of osteoclastic class i think in this case but it also depends on uh, which kind of uh, surgery it is okay uh then the next question are uh, bone marrow immune cells being fed by adipocytes that's also a good point, like uh, from which perspective uh, that uh, uh, we need to still look into like, you know, the dynamics uh, of uh, like, you know, these uh, lipids going like, you know, from which cells and how they are like, you know, uh, used, uh, for example, from a um, point of, uh, for example, um, radiotherapy. That's also uh, when uh, the uh, actual bone marrow is uh, refilled with adipocytes. So these adipocytes are coming to be burst, like, you know, to uh, release, like, you know, this energy for these renewing hematopoietic cells. So it really depends, like, you know, if you are uh, looking at this, uh, like, very fast uh, renewalization, like, you know, of this compartment of the bone marrow, or it's like, you know, the long treatment that we need to look into this uh, interaction. Okay, and finally, are the bone marrow and the and bone marrow immune cells actually they correlate in any way? So, uh, in uh, this way, uh, I would like to also maybe then uh, leave it for a panel discussion uh, that uh, what we define uh, by inflammation, because uh, in the aspect of the uh, bone marrow, so there are these uh, pre like you know precursors which are actually playing uh, like their uh, immune role outside of the bone marrow, but then uh, th there are like these osteoclasts which are staying there and uh, they are playing role in terms of uh, the bone uh, resorption. We don't know yet, like you know that uh, if they are uh, in different, uh, for example, pathophysiological condition, releasing more, for example, cytokines. So it's about like, you know, the function in specific tissue, how it's actually uh, playing and how we are looking at this role, like, you know, the inflammatory state or immune state, or uh, it's uh, also remodeling state. Okay, so yes, please. Uh, you question. Uh, the kind of a hallmark operation is Immune population which is linked to hypothermia further are gamma delta B cells. And these are linked to the differentiation of and functionality of the, as I know, uh, from the, I think there was a nature in the paper uh, showing the production of IL 17 and, and uh, transformation of the white uh, adipose tissue to, to, to browning and somehow controlling the, the expenditure and it could be kind of right from behind the, the hardening and the immune response kind of uh, enhanced responsiveness to, to pathogen so from your perspective the, the person who is interconnecting the immunity and the, and the metabolism uh, for me it seems to be too nice to be true too, too simple to simple connection, which is explaining too much. So what, what do you think? Because gamma delta cells, people are looking for the real function for them. There are several different subtypes and it seems to be key regulators of a energetic metabolism uh, in a, a relevance to the, to the, to the, uh, to the temperature. 
Oh, can you maybe rephrase, like, you know, what is the question? Like, you know, that okay. only that uh, these okay. cells. Your opinion about that. I, I mentioned that that link seems to be too nice to be true. It's so, so, uh, so, so many things explaining in one that there is a gamma delta T cell which is activating during the uh, pulling the temperature down. It goes to the to the fatty tissue and sends the signal for transformation of a bite and a post tissue to bed, which can produce the heat. That's the story behind the paper and all the in the interpretation, which is nice. Uh, linking between the immune system and the energetic metabolism. And uh, you, you showed that it's a very complicated story. Yeah. So and it's oversimplification. So what's your, your, your opinion about it? Okay, so maybe I got it now. You mean specifically in that paper, like, you know, this connection of the specific yes. cell types, yes. of course, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I would ask maybe other question, like, you know, just what is the percentage of this population, like, you know, uh, you know, bringing like, you know, in uh, that aspect of the homeostasis of the tissue, you know, because if it's just one percent or like, you know, even one, I don't know, I am not immunologist, so I don't know about uh, this uh, specific uh, population of uh, T cells. So just, uh, of course, uh, it's more complex in terms of the dynamics of infiltration, different immune cells. So, of course, uh, depends uh, if you pick like you know one window that uh, okay doesn't show like no other uh, you know complications but then when you look into like I don't know like uh, one week later so something else happened like the tissue so if it's giving like you know completely protection over like no longer treatment yeah that's that's nice and that's perfect like you no know, if there is like you know these uh, you know cell types that can you know actually really regulate that process but then I would maybe look into like, you know, that what was uh, like, you know, uh, the uh, context, like, you know, taking from from that uh, experiment to regulating, because of course, yeah, there are several uh, cell types that are like, you know, contributing to this homeostasis. So I always like, you know, trying to emphasize uh, this uh, cellular crosstalk and this, uh, cr uh, you know, uh, different organ crosstalk. Okay. So we, we are going over time, but we also started a little bit late. So if there is still maybe question that there is room for it. Um, so yes, I, I have a question. Uh, is the electromagnetic signal in the reverse tissue does it change in time? Somehow, like with circadian rhythm or some some other events. Yeah, yeah, that's a good uh, point. Like also, yeah, each uh, cell type has a different circadian rhythm, and in each organ, it's happening like you know this regulation differently. So it really depends. Also, I think when uh, the function of that organ has to be like you know prepared. So uh, I think there are now like studies. Uh, I'm not expert into that, but uh, definitely, and it's uh, really interesting. But of course, when you are trying to set up um, experiment in mice, you want to try to like simplify it, like you know as much as possible because if you are regulating different factors, so it's really hard to like have several controls, like, you know, just to have control only one. Thank you. Yeah.